Bonjour et bienvenue à l'Église unitarienne de Montréal. Allô, allô. Bonjour, je suis la révérende Diane Rollert et c'est mon plaisir à vous accueillir et vous voir sous place et en ligne. Good morning, I am the Reverend Diane Rollert. My pronouns are she, her, and elle in French. It is my pleasure to welcome you into this space once again made sacred by your presence here in the sanctuary and connecting to us through Zoom. In this brief time we share, may we do all we can to be one community, to strengthen the connections between us. And we begin with a musical prelude, Duermete Niño Lindo, sung by Eleuthera and Sandra on piano. Sleep now, holy baby, with your head against my chest. Meanwhile, the pangs of my sorrow are soothed and put to rest. Alaru, alame, alaru. Good morning. Bonjour et bienvenue à ce thème de spiritualité et de communauté à l'Église Unitarienne de Montréal. Whether you're here with us in person or on Zoom, I'd like to welcome you and thank you for coming together. And if you're here as a first timer, I want to extend you a warm welcome from our community. My name is Brian Vidal, my pronouns are he and him, and I'm a member of this community. We're here, this month, we're exploring the theme of ab abundance. We begin our service today by acknowledging our presence on the traditional lands of the First Nations. Our church building stands on the unceded territory of the Kanyegahaga people, members of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, on the island of Chochagi. We call this land unceded because it was colonized without treaty or agreement. We acknowledge that non-Indian institutions, including the Unitarian Universalist churches, have played and continue to play a role in this racism and colonialism that undermines indigenous lives and communities. Unitarian Universalism calls us not to shy away from these truths, but to use our energy, resources, and privilege to build a beloved community that supports the efforts of indigenous people to build and rebuild strong communities for the future. We covenant as a community to welcome, to nurture, to inspire, to challenge and take action in the world together. Everyone is welcome here, no matter what our differences may be, whatever our cultural, religious, racial, ethnic, ethnic or socioeconomic identities or backgrounds, our immigration status, gender expression or sexual orientation. 
And whether we are skeptics, mystics, atheists, agnostics, theists, or spiritual seekers, we are grateful for one another presence today in our 179th year as the First Unitarian con Congregation in Montreal and in Canada. This pandemic isn't over and the flu season's here, so we still need to protect ourselves and each other. So please be sure to make your, ca your masks on while we are together indoors and keep two chairs apart. And we continue to invite you to clap, snap, hum, or dance to the music, but not to sing along. Also, we have just acquired a box of, for recycling used masks, and you can find it just in the front, in the entrance. Uh, and now I would like to invite Reverend Diana to light our chalice and Advent uh, candles. We light our chalice today with these words. Come seekers, come great hearts, come dreamers and singers and poets, come builders, come healers. Come those of the soil and those who command the might of machines, carry the sacred flame to make light the windows of the world. Let us light up this space with our welcome. Let us open ourselves to the stories of the season we each have to share. Today, we light three candles in our Advent wreath. We rekindle two flames, one for hope as open and healing as you need it. Une flamme d'espoir, puissions-nous espérer en la raison, la sagesse et la bonté dans ce monde. We rekindle a second flame for faith as wide and mysterious as you name it. Une flamme pour la foi, pour tout ce que nous essayons encore de comprendre. And we light a third candle for love. May love shine brightly within each of us, deepening our connections and making us whole. Que l'amour approfondisse nos relations, puisse-t-il guider notre raison. Puisse l'amour et la lumière en chacun et chacune de nous briller de mille feux, illuminant cette heure. All right. <laughs> may these flames burn with the abundance of hospitality, that we may each have a place we can call home, filled with love and caring. May we always remember to give the best of ourselves to others, to welcome the stranger, to offer friendship, warmth, and shelter, knowing there is no greater gift than our open hearts. This is what it means to offer abundant hospitality. Our opening song is O Come, O Come, Emmanuel, and you're all invited to sing along if you're over Zoom and hum along if you're in the sanctuary. Soul, a 
Today, as we explore the meaning of abundant hospitality, what more appropriate story could we tell than the Christmas story of Mary, very pregnant with a child, and her partner, Joseph, looking for a place to spend the night? And what more beautiful way to tell the story than through the tradition of Las Posadas? So before we start, I'd like to ask Yvette Sedinas, one of our lay chaplains, to tell us about Las Posadas. And we need a microphone for Yvette. Thank you. Okay. Ready? <laughs> okay. Thank you for this opportunity to share something from my culture. In Mexico and in some parts of Central America, Colombia, Venezuela, and Ecuador, Las Posadas has been celebrated for 400 years. In Spanish, a posada means an inn, a place of lodging, a resting place, a shelter. Las Posadas symbolizes Mary and Joseph's long and frustrating search for a place to stay where Jesus could be born with a literal walk through a neighborhood to ask for shelter at people's homes. The night concludes with a happy ending. Somebody says yes. The group gathers around the host nativity scene for a prayer, then a party ensues. This goes on for the nine nights before Christmas. Las Posadas is celebrated in the US and Canada today because the tr tradition was brought over by Latinx immigrants in search of refuge yesterday. So, as I was growing up in South Texas, where Catholic faith and Mexican-American culture collided, Las Posadas was celebrated enthusiastically with family, friends, color, light, food, and above everything else, music. These days, I couldn't easily tell you the words of the songs sung. Like so many childhood memories, what I remember of Las Posadas are hazy and dreamlike, but I can tell you how it felt. My family gathers with friends, schoolmates and neighbors outside our church. It's nighttime, chilly for Texas and dark. So I dress warmly in my favorite gray jacket with blue st stitching and extra deep pockets. Everybody carries a white taper candle with a cardboard circle resting halfway to catch the wax. Mary and Joseph appear, take their place at the beginning of the procession the chattering and joking ceases and we begin to walk the paths of the neighborhood as soft music plays. Then we would be guided to approach the homes of willing participants and Joseph would knock. Then the group would sing, asking for shelter. No seas inhumano, denos caridad, que el Dios de los cielos te lo primeria. Honestly, back then, I never really knew the words to the song, but their meaning and the music washed over me to create a deeply spiritual experience. It was on another level from Caroline, even as Mary and Joseph were denied room at that particular inn. Because eventually, someone would say yes and the night would end with the party. The best thing was the community, being surrounded by others who were celebrating the coming birth of baby Jesus. And so, with the help from Luthra, Brian, Yvette, and 
all of you, we're going to tell an abbreviated version of Las Posadas. Once, the Christian Bible tells us, there was a young woman in a place called Judea. She received a message from God in the form of an angel who told her she would have a baby, a miraculous baby conceived by the love of God for the world, and that this child would be the Messiah, the Savior, the one who would bring peace on earth. Her name is Maria. As the baby's arrival draws closer, a pronouncement is made. Everyone must return to their family's hometown to be counted. And so Maria sets off on the long journey to Bethlehem with Jose, the man she is engaged to marry. Jose walks beside the donkey which carries Maria and everything they bring with them. They walk for many miles. When they arrive, exhausted from their journey, they look for a place to stay, but they are refused at every inn. Finally, as the baby is about to be born, they seek shelter in a stable, and the Messiah comes into the world, not in a great palace or the most ornate temple, but surrounded by oxen and cattle. Check, check, check. Wonderful. Um, <laughs> in the name of the Lord, please provide us with lodging. My beloved wife cannot walk any further. En nombre del cielo, os pido posada, pues no puede andar. Mi esposa amada. Maria, soon to give birth to the baby Jesus and Jose, are so alone in this world. Together they hear the words of those who would turn them away. And this is your cue, our cue, to play the role of the unkind people who turn Maria and Jose away. And we are going to yell out, we're not opening the door. So can I hear that? We're not opening the door. Let us sleep. We're too busy. Go away. Sadly, Maria and Jose continue their search. What choice do they have? Her child would be born soon, and she needs a safe place to give birth. This child carried with love into a faraway place will be too young to know the dangers of the way, the fear of the flight. Sir, we are so weary, traveling straight from Nazareth. I am but a simple carpenter by the name of Joseph. Venimos rendidos desde Nazaret yo soy carpintero de nombre José and once again we the people of Bethlehem who are too busy too tired, too preoccupied, or just too selfish. We refuse to give them shelter, and we yell out, go away now. Go away now. Don't, bother us Don't bother us anymore. You're making us angry. Making us angry. <laughs> There's no room here for you. 
And so Maria and Jose continue in their search for a safe place to spend the night and for Maria to give birth. Please, we request lodging, dear innkeeper, for only one night for the Queen of Heaven. But even so, Maria and Jose's request for shelter falls on unwelcoming ears. And the people reply again, no, we won't open up. If she's a queen who is asking, why is she out at night wandering so alone? If she, why is she out at night wandering so alone? Maria and Jose are sad and discouraged. Maria's legs are swollen and her belly feels so heavy. But the family is hopeful that someone behind the next door will let them in. My wife is Mary. She is queen of heaven and soon to be the mother of the savior. Mi esposa es María, es reina del cielo y madre va a ser del divino verbo. And finally, Someone answers, yes. Oh, you are Jose, and your wife is Maria. Enter, please, dear pilgrims. We did not realize. And that is when everyone celebrates because Maria and Jose have finally found a, pace, a place of welcome. And that's what we all say. Welcome. welcome. Blessed pilgrims. Blessed. Our home is your home. Although it's a simple dwelling, although it's a simple dwelling, it holds love from all our souls. It holds love from all our souls. Entre santos peregrinos, peregrinos, reciban este rincón, no de esta pobre morada, sino de mi corazón. Entre en santos peregrinos, peregrinos, reciban este rincón, no de esta pobre morada, sino de mi corazón. And so ends Las Posadas. And now it is time to share our gifts. Hi, my name is Shoshana Green. My pronouns are she and her, and I'm a member of this congregation. Our community is entirely supported by the generosity of its members and friends. And as part of our commitment to take action in the world, we also share our plate. Each month, we invite you to donate as you're able either online or through our collection baskets outside the sanctuary to a local nonprofit whose values and mission align with ours. And this month, half of the loose cash in our collection baskets will be given to Stella, an organization by and for female identified sex workers in Montreal. For more than 25 years, Stella's mission has been to improve the working conditions and quality of life of sex workers and to educate the general public about sex work. They offer legal information and medical and social support, 
They fight discrimination and promote community and solidarity, both among sex workers and with their allies. They publish newsletters and informational material for sex workers and for the general public. And they work against discrimination and criminalization. To support their work, please go to shaystella.org or place a donation in a basket as you leave the sanctuary. And of course, you can support the Unitarian Church of Montreal on our website, ucmtl.ca, or with a donation in a basket. Thank you. We thank you for sharing your gifts with Stella and with this congregation. And this is also the time of year when we ask our members and friends to make a pledge for our annual financial commitment campaign. And I would like to invite Barbara de Beaupre to share a pledging moment. Thank you, Diane. And, um, oh yes, okay. All right, okay. Um, I get really close here. Okay, um, I, so I don't have to tell you I'm Barbara de Beaupre. <laughs> But uh, um, I haven't been around much. In fact, I, I was going to say I've been, I have been flying under the radar, but the truth is I was right down into a rabbit hole for quite a while now. Um, but I seem to be able to do better now. So um, I might not look all that familiar, but I, I was um, over Zoom, of course, uh, encouraging you about the pledge about this, about this time last year. And for the follow following year, of course, this year that we just had, and you know, it feels eerily like it did last year. Um, it's like we're having the same year again in 2021 that we had in 2020. I don't know about you, but I really wasn't expecting this again this year. Still worried about COVID-19. It feels a bit like the movie Groundhog that keeps replaying, this time the same old year again. You know, in Groundhog it was every day, but we we get it every year. It's, it's a little different this year, though, in that um, our pledge drive isn't really moving forward like it did at this time last year. And... Um, you know, it, it's, it's hard to say why not. Um, I talked to a friend the other day, and uh, she was saying, well, you know, I don't usually pledge, but I do, I do support the uh, church every year. And, um, and I want to remind you that pledging is important and that I've climbed out of my groundhog hole to ask you, please, to think about this church and pledge before everyone here chews their nails to the quick, worrying about this. I'm talking about Chris, our treasurer, and Reverend Diane, Julie and Catherine, and the whole family of hardworking people here, not to mention our magical musical team, led by Sandra and Eleuthera, They've all worked doubly hard last year to bring us into the age of technology. I, for one, can certainly see how much they've improved. They're pros, no question. Let's give them a, a hand. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Seriously, um, we've climbed our way here at uh, UCM through a flood loss of heat, a non-stop pandemic, and of course, isolation for mo almost all of us. Fixing floods and aging heaters and improving technology so that I come to you live and on Zoom um, costs a fair amount of money in case you wanted to know. So we're really hoping that some of you can help us with that, please.
I need to point out that next year in 2022 is no slam dunk for this church. And of course, one of the issues right now is inflation. We're, we're all hearing about it and we're probably all feeling it right now. I, I, it seems to me that even though this is a time where I spend more money, it seems to be disappearing faster than I expected myself. And um, I just wanted to point out to you that the church is having to deal with that same inflation. And um, so if you are able to help us out, and certainly if you were thinking of supporting us anyway and just haven't done the pledging, we'd really appreciate it. And I believe that there are papers out on the uh, desk, and, and <laughs> I've been told, yes, there are. That, will, uh, that you can fill in, because I know that doing it online can be a bit of a challenge. It was for me. So, well, here we are. <laughs> so this may be the year when you need us the most for support, health, and connection, and just possibly the year when we need your support the most as well. So, um, so remember us, and uh, if it's hard for you to give as much as you did last year, we don't mind if you lower your pledge this year, if that's what you need to do. So um, I think that's all I have to say, but um, thanks so much. Thanks so much for listening. Thank you, Barbara. Thank you so much. Check, check, check. We saw a bit of the sausage this morning. The, uh, the battery died on the cordless mic, so. <laughs> um, great, thank you so much. Okay. I'm going to sing um, Cuando el Pobre, which is one of my favorite songs in the hymnal, and I haven't been able to sing it since our last Posada service, which was four years ago when I started here. Um, so I just wanted to give you a bit of a, a translation because I'm going to sing the Spanish verses. The English is very clunky. Um, so it's talking about um, when those who have nothing still give. Um, when those who are thirsty still pass the cup with water to share. Uh, when the wounded offer others strength and healing. And in those moments, we see God here by our side walking our way. Um, I find it very beautiful. Cuando el pobre nada tiene y aún reparte, cuando alguien pasa así de agua nos da, cuando el debe a su hermano fortalece, va Dios mismo en nuestro mismo. Caminar, va Dios mismo en nuestro mismo caminar. Cuando alguno sufre y logra su consuelo, cuando espera y no se cansa. Oh. 
All right, microphone and glasses, always, it's always something, it's always something. Good morning. My name is Catherine Childs, my pronouns are they and them, and it is my honor to offer our reflection this morning. And I'm just gonna turn this microphone so it doesn't screech at us later. So, something that you may know already about Unitarian Universalists is that we do love a good list, right? Eight principles, woo! Six sources, and as Canadians, we even get five aspirations. One of those five aspirations is to be radically inclusive. And here at UCM, this is something that we've really taken to heart. I love the term radically inclusive, and the word radical especially for lots of reasons. But the biggest reason is that like any good turn of phrase, it's deceptively simple. But when we bring that idea into conversation, every single time it blossoms into something really meaningful. When we hear the word radical, we may think of something outrageous, maybe even dangerously so. Or maybe it carries the flighty overtones of a surfer dude. Radical. But radical is an adjective that means to the root. Radical inclusion is a commitment to inclusion which penetrates down to the root of things. And what I hope we can explore today is abundant radical hospitality, a way of approaching welcome which gets down deep into the ground of our being as a community. So I did that surprise kind of math that you do when you're about to turn 40 next year, and I realized that I first started working in ministry with kids more than 20 years ago. Back then, even in my Anglican summer camp milieu, curriculum was king and learning objectives, session goals, and evaluations were all part of my early experiences as a religious educator. Driven, responsible, but barely out of high school, I wasn't able to articulate at the time what was wrong with the programming we were using. But those early experiences have shaped who I have become as a religious educator and how we practice radical hospitality with kids here at church. So here's where I'm gonna let you in on a little bit of the secret sauce of religious education and how we welcome kids to church. It's exactly the same way that we welcome grown-ups to church. Okay, so here's what I mean by that. When we gather as a community, what we create together is a container for us to encounter the holy in ourselves, in each other, in the world around us. What we do in religious explorations, when we were on Zoom, when we were gathered in the children's chapel, and now as we gather in the playground, is to create a container for kids to encounter the holy in the ways that set their hearts and soul ablaze. In the same way that our worship service is a ritual experience, we create rituals in religious explorations which may not look like worship exactly to the outside eye, but, okay, so here's more word nerdery with Catherine, because you knew that was coming. Our modern word worship comes to us as a contraction of the word worthship, the act of paying heed to what is worthy, to what is most important. The act of worship is the act of assigning value, and the way that we create our religious exploration program is to assign value to the things that light up our kids, to the science that makes you say, that's so cool, in awe and wonder, to stories of real people who fought for justice and for what was right, and to the acts of creative expression, which mean each of us can take part in the act of creation. Radical hospitality requires that we assign value also to kids' way of being in the world. Radical hospitality means that we treat kids as though they matter, that they as individuals have worth and dignity just like adults, and that their kidness 
is just as valuable a part of who they are as the experience of our elders, as the nurture of our caregivers, the beauty and strength of our global majority members, and the sparkle of our trans and non-binary siblings. Radical hospitality requires that we all recognize the parts of ourselves and others as valuable, maybe even especially the ways and parts of ourselves that are different from each other. We often use the words welcome and hospitality interchangeably, but I'd like for us to tease out for a moment the difference between the two. When we think of welcome, we often think of the call to welcome the stranger, a call affirmed in our stories from Las Posadas to Beauty and the Beast. Welcoming the stranger is one of our highest virtues, and it's what led this congregation to sponsor refugee families, raise money for food banks, and other ways that we have used our resources to help the marginalized. But what if, what if welcoming the stranger was only the beginning? What if it were only training for the greater work of radical hospitality? When I first started coming to UCM, I spent every Sunday crying all the way through the service, right over there in the corner of the sanctuary, where the playground is now, but was once upon a time the choir seating. The tears I cried in those early days were for my broken heart, which had given up on a dream of ministry because the integrity of my theology and the church that I loved could not be reconciled. I may have been showing up for the worship part, but I'd be lying if I said I didn't also stay for the food. The offer of a meal after church came at a time in my life when that lunch feel, filled a real financial need for my family. And the other young adults who dove in with me immediately into deep conversation over an after-church potluck were a blessing and a balm to my soul. But at the end of the day, even when I was the stranger being welcomed among you, I already knew how to belong. You see, I already knew how to do church the way that we do church here. I knew how to find a hymn by number and not by page number. I knew the hymn tunes, even if the words were a little different. I knew I could cry in the sanctuary and that the response would be gentle. I knew that free will offering for lunch after church really actually meant that I didn't have to pay money to eat. And I had a pretty good idea of how a church runs and where to go for information if I need it. Being welcomed into this community as a stranger was easy for me. I almost never wondered if I would be accepted here. This community already knew how to offer much of the welcome that I needed. And let's be honest, this is a place where my background as white, educated, and middle class, even if I am a little unique looking, marked me as somebody who fit in here. UCM was already poised to offer the welcome that I needed, to come through the doors, which meant it wasn't much of a stretch for this community to also offer the hospitality that I needed in order to stay and to live into community here. The way we do things is part of that hospitality. For those of us who belong most comfortably in the dominant culture, those of us who are white, able-bodied, middle class, whose appearance, family structure, and other outward signs of our inner life don't disrupt mainstream ideas of what belonging is. Those of us like that probably knew that we felt a sense of hospitality here when we first arrived, because this is a space that's designed to welcome us. But what if we're not? If we're going to ask ourselves the question about how we might welcome those who don't immediately feel comfortable here, we have to acknowledge that we are already making choices about welcome, inclusion, and hospitality. Those choices are both in the things that we do and in the things that we don't do. But here's the heart of the matter. No matter how thoroughly we offer welcome, and we should, and no matter how diligently we ferret out white supremacy culture from our congregation, and we should, as long as we continue to model our hospitality on welcoming the stranger, as powerful and meaningful as that work is, we fall short of the aspiration 
to radical, abundant hospitality. And here's why. Radical hospitality is not necessarily about doing the nuts and bolts of welcome differently. It's about all of our striving to erase the false premise that there is an us who do the welcoming and a them who is being welcomed. Welcoming the stranger allows us to flex the muscle, which reminds us that people who are different from us are worthy of love and care and community, just like we are. But what happens when the stranger we've welcomed is no longer a stranger, but somebody who is already among us? Are we prepared to offer radical hospitality? The kind that penetrates down to the root of things? The kind that might require us to change what we do so that our community can be the place of abundant hospitality for another who has different needs than we do. The work of radical abundant welcome begins with our own willingness to acknowledge that each of us have need of welcome. Each of us have need of hospitality and each of us have needs that we need met in order to be in community. All of us from the most insignificant, however we may feel, all the way up to the mother of Jesus. Recognizing our own needs, recognizing how our own needs are or aren't being met is our first step to creating a community of true hospitality. Recognizing that those needs will inevitably come into conflict with the needs of others is our second step. After church lunch and deep conversation with people I didn't know yet were integral to my sense of being welcome here. But I know lots of folks for whom navigating a loud room full of people talking is just a sensory hellscape. The expectation that we can fall easily into conversation with one another isn't so easy if your experience of coffee hour is that it's rife with microaggressions or if you're self-conscious about your English speaking skills. Abundant hospitality means that we take these disparate needs for welcome seriously. It means we work to create structures beyond the way we've always done things to meet the needs of people who are here and that we work to understand the histories, forces, and conditions that create those needs to begin with. Radical hospitality also sometimes means that we need to make choices when our needs come into irreconcilable conflict. The need for our physical space to be as COVID safe as possible to protect our medically vulnerable members and friends is directly at odds with our desire to be a welcoming place for all, which is why our board chose to use the vaccine passport for in-person attendance and to invest in the multi-platform technology that allows both those who are not vaccinated and those too vulnerable to feel comfortable attending in person to be with us on Sunday morning. Father Greg Boyle, a Catholic priest and the executive director of Homeboy Industries, a ministry in urban Los Angeles that helps young men safely escape gang life, is a personal hero of mine. He refers to the practice of welcome as a hallway. Welcome, he says, is not our destination, but the beautiful passageway that we all move through together. The journey down the hallway of welcome is the process of bridging the divide between us, breaking down the illusion of us and them. He names the destination, the grand ballroom where the hallway of welcome lets out, not as radical, abundant hospitality as I have, but as kinship. In kinship, he explains, there is no Father Greg the Healer and that gang member over there in need of healing. We all need healing, he reminds us. We all need welcome and belonging and hospitality. So how can we continue to live into the practice of radical, abundant hospitality? It begins with each of us recognizing our own need for welcome, for healing, for hospitality. And then for us tru to truly recognize and honor the needs of others. I'm going to ask you as I close this reflection to think of a time when you felt truly welcomed. 
call to mind not just the circumstances, but the sights, the sounds, maybe even the smells that spoke to you? How did it feel in your body to experience that hospitality? What was the particular alchemy that brought you to that moment in time? In the days and weeks and months to come, I hope that you have a chance to know one another de deeply and to be known in return. I hope you have the chance to practice abundant, radical hospitality. Thank you. So I want to thank Catherine. One of the great joys that I have is working with Catherine and this amazing team of people here who serve this church with heart and soul. It's just incredible. And I'm going to throw out a little bit of a surprise. It's going to be a surprise for the tech team out there. It's going to be a surprise for everybody in here. Um, we're going to try a new thing today because something that we've really missed since the pandemic is the times that we used to spend in the sanctuary here talking to each other in the middle of a service. Remember doing this, some of you who were here? And so we split into pairs or small groups to speak to each other, to focus on something that came up during the service. So in a moment, I'm gonna invite those who are in the sanctuary to split into pairs, to share thoughts and answer to the question that Catherine has already posed for us. And at the same time, and this is going to be the tech challenge for us, is I'm going to invite those who are online to, to actually join a small group of two or three people. I've already created the groups on my laptop here, and you're going to be responding to the same question. But the trick is that the person who is on the LSM video needs to stay in the main room. Il faut rester LSM, il faut rester dans la salle principale. He's got it. Okay, so each person is going to have two minutes to respond. And it's been a long time since we've done this, but remember, this is what I always refer to as truly a spiritual practice of deep listening. So the person who's speaking gets the full two minutes to speak while the other people listen. No questions, no advice, no trying to fix the other person, just listening. And each time I'll let you know when the two minutes have passed. And if someone interrupts you while you're speaking, you can just say, it's my time. That's all you need to say. And hopefully they'll remember that it's your time. So. As Catherine asked, think of a time when you felt truly welcomed. And what was it that made you feel so welcome? So you can think again for a moment. And um, for those who are online, in a moment I'm going to open the breakout rooms. And all you have to do is click on the little button that says join. And then you'll be in a room with two to three people. And, and then uh, in the meantime, so I'm going to um, invite those who are here in the sanctuary, find perhaps find somebody that you didn't come in with to speak to, and you can try to do it in pairs. If that will work, that would be the best to do. It's just two to two, but of course, I don't know how many people are in the sanctuary. Maybe some groups will have to be three, but I'd like two, no more than three. So you can go ahead and start to share with each other, and I'm going to start the timer in a second. So you might start by just introducing yourselves, and then I'll let you know when the timer begins, and then I'm going to let the people online get into their small groups. <laughs> 